Artisans, when humankind discovers something new, we inevitably try putting it in our mouths. And the game of can I eat this thing sometimes yields valuable surprises. For example, our ancestors domesticated wild animals, took their milk, mixed it with bacteria and mold, and let it age inside of animal stomachs for long enough that cheese was invented. I guess we got lucky on that one. But today we are talking about a failed experiment, one that taught policymakers in the United States a valuable lesson about safety regulation, because a rich person died. Ebenezer McBurney Byers was a wealthy how-do-you-do born in 1880. His father, Alexander McBurney Byers, was not just a rich man, but a rich and famous man. The Byers family was very well known around Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for several reasons. They controlled mills responsible for pumping out various iron products. They had an art collection described as one of the finest in the United States. They were members of various bank-related administrative boards. And Ebenezer, whom everyone referred to as Eben, was quite a golfer, winning a major championship in 1906. Even though Eben was the second youngest child out of five, he ended up inheriting vast swaths of the Iron Empire that his father had built. This was because the oldest child was his sister, Maud, and back then, women were not seen as equal under the law. Can you imagine a female Iron Baron? Huh, she'd probably be too conscientious to properly exploit the labor of her workers. That'll never work. <laughs> <laughs> Instead, she was married to a banker named J. Deniston Lyon. Next oldest was Alexander McBurney Byers Jr., who died young followed by Dallas Cannon Byers, who, despite having an amazing name, also died young. That left Eben and his younger brother, J. Frederick, to take over as president and vice president of their father's iron company, respectively. The Byers family lived in an opulent L-shaped mansion, with one wing occupied by Maud, her husband, and their children, and the other by Alexander, his art collection, and the remainder of the family. That's where Eben grew up, with Rembrandt on the walls, at least ten servants employed full-time in the mansion, and in a neighborhood of Pittsburgh that included dozens of millionaires in the early 1900s. Side note, Ghost Story Edition. The Byers Mansion is now part of a community college, and is reportedly haunted, because one of Maud's children fell through a skylight and died there back in 1902. Reportedly, the nanny who was supposed to be watching the child hung herself in despair. Both the child and the nanny were reportedly spotted as super spooky ghosts. The ghost story claims that Alexander never spoke to Maud again after the death of his grandchild. And considering that Alexander died in 1900 and the grandchild died in 1902, that's probably true. But all of this wealth and fame and extravagance could not save Eben from the thing that killed him. Trendy healthcare products. For you see, Eben was injured one day in 1927 after falling out of bed. Specifically, he was sleeping on an elevated bunk on a chartered train that was on a return trip from the annual Yale Harvard football game. The train suddenly lurched to a stop and he fell out of his bunk and onto his arm. A slightly different version of the story is that he got so drunk in celebration of the Yale team winning that he just drunkenly rolled off of the bunk. But however it happened, it was a problem because it produced a permanent injury to his arm and he was a golfer. He complained to several doctors about the pain and eventually one of them prescribed something interesting. Because Eben was rich and this was the early 1900s, he would have had access to cocaine, opium, or a number of other horrifying painkillers. But the doctor elected to give him something completely new and very fancy. It was a health potion called Radithor. The manufacturer wanted people to think of it as a medicine, but get this, it wasn't. It was a small bottle of radioactive water, which meant to serve as an energy drink of sorts. You might be wondering, how do you make water radioactive? Well, that's easy. You just put radium in the water. Radium is a dangerous radioactive element found in the Earth in small quantities. Scientists working with newly discovered radioactive elements in the early 1900s were not aware of how dangerous they were to work with, and several researchers died from exposure. 
But the big problem was that radiation exposure kills slowly, so slowly that the real risks were not understood for decades. Which gave capitalism enough time to find a way to sell radium to the public. Radithor was just one of these products. It was marketed aggressively in at least two ways. Doctor recommendations and straight-up product advertising. Yeah, that's definitely how that word is pronounced. <laughs> First, doctors and researchers recommended radioactive water in publications, including this one from 1911, published in the British Medical Journal that claimed that drinking radium water led to many benefits, including considerable increase in vitality, both general and sexual. Originally, these recommendations were based on bathing in natural hot spring water, which was a bit radioactive. Later, once money got involved, the recommendation became drinking radioactive water, in which they had greatly increased the dosage of radiation. My favorite passage comes from 1921, published in the American Journal of Clinical Medicine. After listing all the reasons he hates alcohol, the author writes, However, like a guardian angel, radium has come to the rescue. In all its manifestations, it is the antithesis of alcohol and an antidote to its destructive action. Radium is the very essence of life, vivifies the living cell to renewed activity, promotes digestion, gives increased vigor to all nutritive processes, stimulates the intellectual faculties, prevents insanity, rouses noble emotions by promoting a healthy brain, retards the advance of old age, and creates splendid, youthful, joyous life. In the same article, the doctor advocates that drinking radium water is a thoroughly safe and efficient method, and also states that for the last six years I have been administering radium emanation water intravenously for the treatment of diseases. He bases his health-related claims on the fact that natural hot springs have radium in them, and that the most popular bathing places in the world today are those in which the waters have the reputation of being strongly charged with radium emanation. It was later discovered that the benefits of bathing in naturally radioactive hot springs were in fact probably not due to the radioactivity, because experiments showed that hot spring water that wasn't radioactive still made people feel better. By the beginning of the 1930s, researchers were beginning to doubt the magical effects of radium for most diseases, except for cancer. In other words, radium did seem to be useful in destroying some tumors. There is a series of before-after photos of people with facial tumors treated with radium from a 1922 medical text linked in the description. Check it out if you're interested and have a strong stomach. But the problem was that some doctors were overprescribing radium treatments for things that didn't make any sense. A reason for this was at least one company selling radioactive products was giving kickbacks to doctors, paying them money to prescribe the radioactive products. The prescriptions were often for general annoyance problems, including gout, arthritis, and renal calculus. I'm going to tell you what renal calculus is in just a second, but first, please take a guess. Renal calculus is just another term for kidney stones. Please drop that fun fact off at the next water cooler conversation you happen across. Secondly, advertising for Radithor and other radium products was aggressive, appearing in all sorts of magazines, papers, and pamphlets. A common tagline used for Radithor pamphlets and ads was perpetual sunshine. Other products touted that radiation added energy to the body, like recharging a battery. Some products were put on the surface of the skin, like cleanser, lotion, and makeup products. But others were worn around the body, like this testicle girdle. Yes, really. And if drinking the radium wasn't enough, there was always the alternate route, in the form of radium suppositories. Yes, really. If you do an image search online for radium water advertising, you can see several more of these for yourself. Radithor was a higher-end product, costing around $1 per bottle during the Great Depression, which would be kind of like spending $13 on a coffee during the housing market crash of 2008. 
Radium was ridiculously expensive to extract back then. Making a single pure gram of radium, enough for a million bottles of Radithor, required hundreds of thousands of dollars in materials. One estimate put the needed ingredients at up to 500 tons of milling ore, 500 tons of chemicals, 10,000 tons of purified and distilled water, and 100 tons of coal. Radium was a luxury item. And because Radithor was both trendy and spendy, Eben gladly tried it. And not only did he try it, but he continued to take it for at least two years. According to the Wall Street Journal, he also sent some to his business partners, his girlfriends, and even gave some to his racehorses. Arguably, he was interested in the effects that it would supposedly have on his notorious playboy-style love life. According to a 1932 newspaper called the Reading Eagle, which literally just declared bankruptcy today on the day I'm writing this, Eben ended up drinking over 1,400 bottles of Radithor over the course of at least two years. In 2019, that would be roughly equivalent to spending $21,000 on a swarm of teeny tiny robots that pump all of your bones and organs full of teeny tiny bullets. Because that's what radiation effectively is. I'm simplifying a bit, but radium is constantly shooting out tiny bullets in all directions in the form of fast-moving particles. The reason radiation destroys tumors is that it shoots holes in the DNA of cancerous cells. But it doesn't discriminate. It'll shoot a hole in practically anything, which was unfortunate for Eben. The thing about radium getting inside of your body is that it mimics calcium, meaning that your body will mistakenly incorporate it into your bone structure. From there, it will shoot out its tiny radiation bullets into your bone marrow, your blood, and your organs until the damage is so extensive that your body begins to fall apart. Eben's body began to deteriorate. He stopped drinking the Radithor in 1930, but it was too late. The radium was already inside of him. He got worse. His bones began to splinter. His skin turned yellow. Holes began forming in his skull. His upper jawbone had to be mostly removed because it was falling apart. Eventually, he was too ill to move, and people who came to see him, such as lawyers, had to meet him in his bedroom to help him testify. He rapidly lost weight, and by the time of his death in 1932, he weighed only 92 pounds. According to Deborah Blum's book, The Poisoner's Handbook, his autopsy revealed necrosis in both jaws, anemia, brain abscess, in the right cerebral cortex, damaged kidneys, and ravaged bone marrow. According to the Reading Eagle, he only had six teeth remaining at the time of his death. The rest had fallen out. His bones were so radioactive that the medical examiner put some of his bones inside of black photography paper and film, and his vertebrae exposed the paper with their radiation, forming an image of the bone. Investigations into the decline and death of Eben Byers were swift. His brother-in-law, Maud's husband, J. Deniston Lyon, called for an investigation into radium. They were called upon several times to speed up the investigation, according to the Reading Eagle. Even though poor people were already suffering and dying from exposure to radium, most notably young girls working in radium product factories, which I discussed in a previous episode, this time people paid attention because of the celebrity death. Following the death of Eben Byers, researchers ramped up efforts to determine a safe amount of radiation exposure. The Federal Food and Drug Administration, usually called the FDA, which is today responsible for approving the contents of things that Americans put in their bodies, did not have the power to do that at the time of Eben's death. The reason that they got their legal powers expanded in order to protect consumers from harmful ingredients was partially thanks to what happened to Eben. Eben's body was buried in a lead-lined coffin at the family crypt between his brothers Alexander and Dallas. Thirty-three years later, in 1965, as part of a project concerning radium, his body was briefly exhumed by a team of researchers. His bones were still silently emitting the radiation that had killed him. Thank you for watching this episode of Art Explains. Please leave a like and a comment, and if you're not already subscribed, now's your chance. And if you're interested in supporting the show, I sell Art Explains magnets through my website, and I also have a Patreon. I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.